Now, this is the way they pose it to you. And I have said before that sometimes you don't just get a question, you get a method prescribed <coughs> along with the question. I've never seen this particular method prescribed in an HSC before. I've seen a few of them. Um, I don't like this method especially, okay? You'll see the reason why. It's not because it's particularly long or anything. I just feel, and maybe it's just because of the way my particular brain works, it's fraught with error, okay? It's a little bit, for me, it's a little bit like pouring, um, you know, a kettle of boiling water with my wrong hand. Now, I can do it, but I'm kind of asking to get burned. Like, I'm sure I'm going to spill it somewhere and it's going to be a disaster for me. So that is why I consciously avoid this method. But it still works, it's still accurate, if you do it right. Um, and some people use it and that's fine, okay? So let's have a go at this. Solve this inequality with a table of values, okay? Now the first thing you have to do, just like the method that I suggested, if you do this graphically, the first thing you must always do is factorize because you need to, you can't read off features from this thing if it's not factorized. But that's not too hard in this case, right? So you've got x minus two on the numerator. How shall I write the denominator? X, X, plus X plus three, good. Okay, fantastic. So now that I've identified this factorized form, I'm going to use it to read features about this graph from its factors. Okay, example. Here, there's a feature. That X minus two on the numerator. It tells me that two is an important feature of that rational function. Okay. Um, if it were a polynomial, the whole thing, like a cubic or a quadratic, I'd call it a root. But it's a bit of a misnomer here because the shape of this thing is going to look nothing like a, you know, it's not going to pass through the axis neatly. So a better way to call it is a zero, okay? Because if I put two into this thing, the whole thing becomes zero. So it's called a zero, okay? Now, off the denominator, I read about two other features. Zero and negative three. Now, they're not zeros, are they? Right? Uh, it's, it's zero. Now... Remember, I'm trying to stop thinking about this visually as much as I can, right? Because that's the whole point of this approach, table of values. Like, I don't know what this looks like. So I'm not going to call them asymptotes. Even if I drew y equals x minus 2, blah, 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 it would be. Instead of that, the, the more technical name that corresponds to this is they're discontinuities. They are discontinuities. Now, that's still kind of a visual word, but it's not as visual as asymptote. What does that mean? It means when you put in these values, the function breaks, right? A, a continuous function is a nice smooth curve, and for any value of x that you put into it, you'll get a corresponding y value. But if you put these in, you get nothing. It just explodes on you, right? So at those points, the graph breaks, or the function breaks. There, there are gaps in it, discontinuities. So these three numbers are important features, okay? On either side of these important features, because I'm trying to solve a inequality, right? On either side of these features, the sign of the function changes from positive to negative or negative to positive. That makes sense. If you've got a zero, right, it either goes from like beneath the axis to above and then it passes through zero or vice versa. So you're going to have a change of sign. Right? Okay, so since these three are my important values, what I want to do is I want to work out what happens in between them, right? So here's how I'm going to start filling in the table of values. Uh, what's the order of this? Negative 3, then 0, then 2. Okay, I'm going to put these in here. You'll notice I have a whole bunch of gaps in between them. Okay? And I'm going to use them to actually have values that I will test on this actual function. Right? Before I put those values in, before I pick some numbers, I'm just going to note down. Uh, I'm going to write disk for discontinuity there. Right? There's a discontinuity here. And here, the function is equal to 0. Okay, just for now, dodge the fact that there's no y in this. You guys know what's going on. That's the, the whole function. Okay, could have called it f of x, I suppose. All right, now I pick some values. I choose some values that lie in these regions that I'm going to evaluate this function on. Okay, and I should choose them to make things easy for me. So I'm going to pick, you know, integers. I'm going to pick ones that are relatively small if I can. So for instance, here. I'm going to choose negative 4. In between negative 3 and 0, what would you suggest? Negative 1. Because 1 is the least complicated number I can work with, which means I'm going to choose it there as well. And a suggestion for after 2. 
Five hundred, because you're a jerk. Okay, uh, if you want to make things hard for yourself, put in an astronomically large number. If you don't, choose a small number. All right, so now I have these one, two, three, four values that I must test. I want to know what's this thing equal to at negative four, at negative one, and so on. Let's just quickly do one of them. You can see the process, and then I'll do the rest of them because I've already worked them out. Okay. So let's try this one. When x equals negative 4. Okay, so now I'm evaluating. What's this thing equal to? Well, on the numerator, I've got negative 6. On the denominator, I'm going to have negative 4 times minus 4 plus 8, which is negative 1. Okay, so that's just 4, right? So what have I got here? What's my actual value? Negative, negative, three or which negative is 6 on 4, which is negative 3 on 2. Okay, so that's my value, and that's what I put into here. Uh, now I'm going to repeat that process for all of these. Okay, can you see, by the way, what I'm doing here is what I tried to do visually with you before when I did the regions. And I said, look, I've got three negative numbers over here. So if you put them together, you'll get a negative. I'm not really interested in its magnitude. I just want to know if it's positive or negative, right? And I have a negative. Okay, now just quickly. Because here's one I prepared earlier. I've already worked out what these three values are. If I've done my numbers right, I should get 302, negative a quarter, and an 18th. I think you can go ahead and you can check that, okay? Pretty confident of the signs anyway. What does this mean? You can see there's this flipping around business, right? Negative, positive, negative, positive, which is what you would expect of the function. When you saw what they looked like, you're going to be flipping signs every time, right? Now what I want to do is I want to see which of these satisfies the inequality. Okay? So where am I less than or equal to zero? Does this check out? Is this less than or equal to zero? Yes, it is. So that's within the domain. That's good. Okay. What about this? No, it doesn't because it doesn't exist. Okay. But it's important you note that because that's going to affect the boundaries that I write in a second. Right? Three on two, no good. Discontinuity, no good. Negative a quarter. Tick, right? It works. Yeah. Zero, it's inclusive. Aha, right? You can see why I actually put these in because I want to check whether my boundary will be a filled circle or a hollow one. And then one on 18, uh, busted. Okay, so now I know the places that satisfy the inequality. Now I can actually write this thing, okay? So let's look over here. You can see if I put in negative four, if I put in negative three and a half, negative three and a quarter, etc., I'm still going to be negative all the way up until this point, and then it breaks. Okay? So the answer, the, the x inequality that corresponds to that is, uh, I'll do it over here, x is less than, not including, negative 3. That's, that's all I get from that. Over here, I'm okay until negative 3. Uh, wrong, wrong, aha, now it starts working again. This part's okay, right? And this part's okay. So between here and here, right, except for that boundary, between here and here, I'm good. So I can say, or zero, not inclusive, because it's a discontinuity, remember? X less than, and I can include two, because it's a zero, right? It actually satisfies the inequality. And I'm done, right? So that was the method. You can kind of see, hopefully, some of the reasons why I dislike it. Uh, even, even say this step here, you just get caught up in numbers, which are completely immaterial to answering the question, right? I just want to know about signs. I just want to know about regions. Uh, it probably did take a bit longer because I was explaining it in a way that other questions we've already looked at graphs before and you just look above, below, done. Um, I also am not a huge fan of, like, here you have to be super careful, right? Whereas, let's just quickly compare. Okay. I'm just going to rewind in my head back to this point. Okay, once I have this, I can do this really quickly, right? Let's go, two to zero, so I'm gonna go one, two. I go through there. Zero is an asymptote, negative one, two, three is an asymptote. Think about what this thing's gonna be doing as x gets really large. The numerator's gonna grow, but the denominator's gonna take over. Can you see that? It's quadratic, it's gonna explode, right? So I'm gonna have an asymptote of y equals zero, and then I can think, okay, I want to have three negatives over on the left-hand side. 
Three negatives multiplied, divided, any other combination will give me a negative, right? So, really quickly, region, it's going to swap. Uh, region, region. That's enough. I can draw this thing now. Watch. One, two, three. Okay. Now, how do I know it does that? Partly because I have seen these before. Fine. But just, just logic it out for yourself. Have a look over here. Right? What's going on? I have to be negative, right? I went through the regions processor that I did before. I just did it mentally. Okay? I have to be negative, and I'm constrained within these asymptotes. Where are you going to go? Right? You can't cross a vertical asymptote, so nothing's going to happen over here. What about here? You can't go over the asymptote because you must be negative. So you can't be in this region at all. You have a similar thing in here, except even worse, right? You're locked in this region and you're between these, these kinds of bars, right, that, that lock you in. Uh, over here, now this is a bit more interesting. I did allude <coughs> to these before, but here's an example. Think about what happens down here. I must approach the asymptote. Right? I must go through this. And then it's very easy to see when you put in values like 100, 1,000, a million, you're going to come back down to zero. So you can't just go up and then go off forever. He's got to come back down to the asymptote. And when I teach you how to differentiate when we do calculus, right, you'll learn to identify there's this thing here called a stationary point that makes it turn around and come back toward the asymptote. None of that matters for just answering the regions question. Look, I want greater than or equal to, uh, sorry, lesser than or equal to zero, right? Not inclusive to the left. Inclusive, sorry, no, yeah, inclusive, not inclusive. Done. You go home. Okay. So, I really prefer this method. You can, you can see where it works. And you don't have to fuss around with a large value and all these calculations, which I conveniently skipped for you, but it would have taken some time to actually work them out. Okay.